did, by the way. Some people think we are. Uh, who, was, who won more town in 2010 for Labour, has kept it ever since. The first Labour councillor ever in Moortown Ward, and who I know this May will have an even bigger majority than she's had before. And the reason why, my friends, is because she does the work. And that's the important thing. She does the work for the people that put their trust in her. And I also want to pay my tribute to Angela Wenham. Now, I hope those of you from the Round Day Ward living here, uh, sorry, living in Round Day Ward that are here today, will put your trust in her as the new councillor for Round Day when Christine and Gulam retire in May. Because I have known Angela for many years, and she is one of the hardest workers I've ever met. She knows everybody in the communities that she lives in at the moment. She will be a huge asset, not just to the Labour Party, but to every citizen who puts their faith in her to be their councillor on May the 3rd. So thank you, Angela, for putting your name forward. Um, on the 27th of January, 1945, British soldiers entered the concentration camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau for the first time, having beaten back the Nazi soldiers, the German army, uh, and having uh, fought through into Poland. What they found was to change the world, I think, forever. Because they found the victims of an industrialized genocide, the like of which the world has never seen before, and which we hope we will never see again. But tragically, my friends, we've seen the genocides in Rwanda, we've seen in genocides in Cambodia, and we've seen genocides in Bosnia, of Bosnian Muslims not least in Srebrenica. And so we haven't learnt as a human race. Now, why do I raise this today? We heard, I've just come from the Holocaust Remembrance event, as Sharon has, as others have, uh, at the town hall this afternoon. And what we heard there was a first-hand account from the woman who is now the ambassador for Cambodia in the United Kingdom. And she talked about what this genocide did to her family and how many of her family were lost in the killing fields that Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge uh, introduced between 1974 and their downfall in 1979. Now, how is this relevant to why we're here today? Because, my friends, the theme of Holocaust remembrance this year is the power of words. The power of words. Now, we've been talking this afternoon about freedom of expression. But there are still many nations in the world. China, for example. Iran is another one. But there are many others, tragically. And we've heard about Kashmir as well. Where if you say what you believe, and you express your view, you can be arrested. You can be tortured. You can be murdered. You can be executed. And Saudi Arabia, there are many nations in the world that, tragically, this still persists. But we're here to talk about Kashmir. And we're here to talk about Kashmiri citizens who are British. And I'm grateful to Dalat Ali, my old friend who used to work here in Leeds. Because, and congratulations as, as well, Dalat, on being the deputy leader of Rochdale City Council. Well deserved. He's fought for the right for all British Kashmiris to say on the census that they're not Pakistani, they're not Indian, they are Kashmiri. That is your right, and I support that, and always have done. Now, there have been attempts, and he alluded to those attempts, to stop many of us expressing our views. If we don't support Pakistan in Kashmir, we're not allowed to say anything else. But my friends, we're here today because we believe, not just in the right of freedom of expression, but the right of self-determination. And we live in a country where we value that right of freedom of speech, where it will not be removed, we will not be told what to say and what to think, we will express ourselves freely and not be intimidated and not live in fear. Because you might remember, many of you, and, Dalat, uh, and Gulam referred to this earlier, during our general election campaign last year, I received phone calls in April, just as it was announced, telling me not to attend the meeting that we held over in Bermontoff's near St. James's Hospital, with my good friend, Sardar Shokat Ali Kashmiri, and many of you in this room, with our council colleagues, I was told, do not go to that meeting. 
because they just want to attack Pakistan. I haven't heard anybody attacking Pakistan or hating Pakistan. We love Pakistan, we love India, but we love freedom too. And we will have our free Kashmir, and it will be what the Kashmiri people want. In, on, the, on the 1st of July 2013, the last and the latest country to join the European Union uh, gained full membership, and that country is called Croatia. Now, why do I mention that? It's part of the former Yugoslavia, part of the terrible civil war that saw so many Bosnian Muslims imprisoned in concentration camps, reminiscent of the Second World War and the Nazis. But it's important for another reason, because Croatia, like most of former Yugoslavia, was under the yoke of an oppressive communist regime, a regime that forbade you to say what you believed, what was in your heart, to stand up there and use the one gift that separates humanity apart from every other creature on God's earth, our ability to communicate with words, with language, to one another, without hitting each other, without violence, without causing death. Now, we don't use it enough. We know that. We just have to look around the world. But this is a gift that allows us to use rational argument, the power of our minds and brains, to resolve our disputes, not through violence, through the gift of language. And the significance of Croatia being the last country to join the EU is that now its constitution must include the right to freedom of expression and freedom of the media. And that's important because it's something they never had before. But they now have it for as long as they remain members of the EU. And may that be a long, long time, if only it were true for us in this country. I'm just going to finish, my friends, just by mentioning something that uh, Gulam said earlier. I have the privilege of being the Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament. And that may not mean much, but it's very important because there is no Minister for Peace and Disarmament. But when we're elected to government, whenever that may be, we will create a Ministry of Peace and Disarmament. Why? Because we believe strongly that you cannot have a civilized society, you cannot benefit from a health service or public services or the freedom and security we take for granted in the United Kingdom, generally, without peace, without being able to live without fear of violence, to live in safety and security, knowing that if any human being tries to attack us or uses violence against us, they will be dealt with by the full force of the law. You cannot have a civilized society without peace. And you certainly can't have it, whatever the Americans may say, with everybody holding a gun to everybody else's head. So disarmament is absolutely essential too. And that is the role that I've been given. And I am determined not just to try and carry that out. It's a tall order, isn't it? But also to make sure that we have a comprehensive policy for the next Labour government to implement that here in our country so that we can not only live safely, securely in peace in Britain, but we can ensure we do our best with all the resources at our disposal to help the peoples of the world, including our brothers and sisters in Kashmir, to live in peace and harmony with one another. It's a tall order, I know, but we can achieve it. So my friends, never be intimidated. Never live in fear that what you believe cannot be said, as long as you're saying things that do not incite others to violence. It is acceptable to say what you believe. It is your right, it is your duty and I wish you well in that. You will always have my support, the support of our Labour Party and all our, all our elected officials here in this room, current, present and future. Thank you for inviting me today.